Hi everyone, in this video we will be dealing with another four set of literary terms and concepts that were asked for June 2020 exam. So this is the fourth video in this series. So if you haven't watched the other three videos, make sure to watch it because you would get an idea about how to prepare notes and how to go through the questions that were asked from literary theory for NTA net exam. So in the last video, we discussed about four important concepts uh, that comes under literary theory, including super reader, biopower, bricolage and chronotype. And in this video, we will be dealing with the this question that deals with another four literary terms and concepts where you have to identify the terms with their relative theories that is the persons or the personalities who made the concept or made the term popularized or coined the term. So these are the terms that were asked for the last exam. RK creature, Ziborg genotype and hermeneutic cycle. Okay, so these are the four terms. Uh, RK creature, Ziborg genotype and hermeneutic circle. So let's go to the theorist. So the name of the theorist are Julia Kristeva, Donna Haraway, Frederick Schermacher and Jack and Jack Derrida. Okay, so these were the four writer, four theorists: Julia Kristeva, Donna Haraway, Frederick uh, Schermacher, and also and finally. Yak Derrida. So, you have to identify the terms with their respective theorist. So, let us have a look on the first term that is RK Ekricher. So, RK Ekricher, uh, just like the concepts, the other concepts like Ekricher or the difference, logocentrism, binary, and his oppositions of binary uh, opposition, you can find that Derrida he coined this term RK Ekricher. Okay, so it's a term that comes under post structuralism and deconstruction, and the term is coined by RK, uh, the term is coined by Yak Derrida. So, let us have a look on what this RK Ekricher means. So, Derrida, he conceptualized a creature in an attempt to reorient the established hierarchy of speech over writing or logocentrism. So, uh, while we were deal while we discussed about Yak Derrida, we discussed that Derrida, he was completely against the structuralist belief of logocentrism, where one is considered to be good and the other one is considered to be bad, where one is superior and the other one is inferior. So, such logocentrism, all also exist for or such bio so, uh, so logocentrism is the uh, West, Western Western concept which actually gives superiority to speech over writing. Okay, so remember that logocentrism is the Western philosophy that gives superiority to speech over writing, and this logocentrism or speech over writing was considered to be another binary opposition. And just like how Derrida simply opposed this concept of by uh, concept of binary opposition, he opposed this concept of logocentrism that gave uh, dominance to speech over to the writing. So that is where, in order to uh, in order to reorient that establishment, he he uh, coined the term R K Ekricher. So Ekricher is any system that is characterized by absence and difference, or we can say that it is the French word for writing. For example. We can find that in Western metaphysics, they believe that the speech is often superior than writing because speech often have the so-called presence of a speaker and that actually gives the credibility. So, when there is no speaker, you have to uh, believe in writing. So, writing comes as the secondary form or writing comes as an inferior form. So, écriture, it is actually the French word for writing that actually according to Derrida is any system that is characterized by absence and difference because in writing the author is absent in writing the anything that produces the text is actually absent okay so writing it is based on this absent and also on the difference you are creating the meaning for yourself so that is where he coined the term a creature so According to him, a creature 
is writing a uh, creature denotes writing as a social institution and as a group of interrelated texts that actually points to intertextuality so a creature it actually means writing so according but writing in a much more broader sense where writing is considered to be a social institution where one particular text is related with other particular text and writing is not something that comes just because the speaker is absent then go you have got no other options but this is again another form of uh, speech or this is again another form of representation so a creature it points to intertextuality where one text leads to the other text so we know intertextuality that is no text can be read in isolation no text is detached no text is individualistic in its own form every text has got uh, or every text belongs to another larger structure to which it belongs and this larger structure again goes broad or again belongs to another larger structure so that is what is called as intertextuality where no text can be read in isolation and every text is part of a larger structure of culturally endorsed collection of text and meanings so we can say that a creature it celebrates a separation of writing from the spoken or the authoritative origin it does not consider itself to be inferior or itself to be uh, under the speech but it is here we can find that they are celebrating this absence they are celebrating this detachment from the origin or detachment from the uh, fr from its credibility so that is what a creature does it celebrates the uh, separation of writing from the spoken and it designates the totality of what makes inscription possible okay it designates the totality of what makes inscription possible and it is an anti logo centric in that it exists before and beyond the logos or the present so here it is completely we can say that it is anti logo centric it does not um, Uh, it does not believe that logos or the words are superior i mean speech is more superior than writing it actually exists as another entity okay it has got nothing to do with the speech writing is another form of artistic expression so it it exists before or it exists beyond the beyond the logos or beyond the presence and according to him a creature it contains all the differences and deformments that constitute language and it refers to the diffusion of identity the self the signifier and the signified through a vast network of relations and differences so here you can find that a creature it constitutes the entire chain of signifiers itself and the endless movement of uh, differences so the signifiers we know how the entire chain of signifiers so the the vast number of signifiers and the endless movement or the endless movement of difference where one word leads to the one words actually postpone one meaning postpones or the 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 meaning is actually postponed so here you can find that this actually is not something that can be related with speech or related with presence okay this is something that happens within this particular text this is something that happens between the lines of a written text so that is what is called as a creature but one thing that happens in a creature is that there is often a chance to consider a creature to be important than speech okay so if such a thing happens then the entire concept of a creature would be useless because a creature he coined the term or he brought the term a creature in order to show that writing is not anything that is inferior to uh, speech okay so when this writing becomes superior the entire concepts becomes useless or the entire concepts concept become an ironic so in order to avoid that mistake he uh, coined the another term called rk creature okay he coined the term called acre a creature so acre a creature is again another term coined by derrida in order to refer to a kind of writing that precedes both the speech and writing okay any form of writing so this is something that happened or this is something that uh, happened in language before the speech and writing so when an acre a creature exists the speech and writing it would be same under this acre a creature okay the speech and writing 
writing would be same under this RK creature. So remember that in order to bring equality to both this speech and the writing, in order to show its anti-logocentrism and anti-binary opposition, Derrida coined this term called RK creature that refers to a kind of writing that uh, precedes both the speech and writing. Okay, so we can say that RK creature is like a language that existed there before we even use it. Okay, so it was there and we finally found it and started to use it. So that is the process of this RK creature. So the speech can be seen as a form of writing. Okay, so the writing as we think what it is, it is also a form of writing and speech is also a form of writing. So both the speech and the writing, they are same under RK creature. And there is no fundamental dominance at work in a creature. So there is nothing, we cannot say that one is superior to other. So there is no binary opposition position this actually exists as two equal parts so that is a creature and anti creature by uh, sorry rk creature by uh, yak derrida so moving on to the next term that is cyborg so you might be familiar with the term cyborg because cyborg was actually the first uh, words that were used in order to represent this uh, robots okay so cyborg, this term was very much explained by Jonah Haraway in her essay, A Cyborg Manifesto. Okay, in order to explain uh, the concept of cyborg, she, you, she discussed, discussed that in the essay, Cyborg Manifesto. So here, uh, in this particular essay, the concept of cyborg is a rejection of rigid boundaries, notably those separating human from animal and an human from machine. So here she uses the term cyborg. So cyborg is like half animal and half, sorry, half human and half robot. So here this cyborg, the term, it actually rejects the boundaries between a animal and a human and a human and a uh, human from a machine. So that is what is called as a cyborg. So, um, Donna Haraway cyborg theory, it rejects the notions of essentialism, proposing instead a symoric monstrous world of fusions between animal and machine. Okay, so this concept of or this theory of cyborg, it was completely against essentialism. So, we know what essentialism is. Essentialism means essence precedes existence. That means we are here because we have a purpose. We have an essence in ourselves. So, that is what is called as essentialism. So, we know that cyborg, it rejects this essentialism because according to cyborg according to this cyborg theory it actually proposes a monstrous world of a monstrous world of fusions okay a monstrous world of integration between an animal and a human so it actually rejects the boundaries that separates a human from an animal and a human from a machine so Haraway's work addresses the chasm between feminist discourses and the dominant language of Western patriarchy. Okay, here you can find that she also uses this term cyborg in order to explain cyborg feminism where she addresses the um, issues of female discourses and the dominance of the dominance of language on western patriarchy so this is actually another problem that you can find in the works of virginia wolf where she discusses that the language is extremely gendered since the language since the literature all these were controlled by man the words are all in favor of him so we can say that a language is gendered so this is again the same case that she is trying to express through this metaphor of cyborg so she uses the figure of the cyborg to urge feminists to move beyond the limitations of traditional gender, feminism and politics. Okay, so she uses the figure of the cyborg in order to propagate or in order to promote the feminists to move beyond the limitations of traditional gender, feminism and politics because she was trying to move away from all these so-called limitations or all these so-called differences that actually, that actually forms as a boundary. Okay, so she actually urges the feminists to move beyond what actually limits them. So be it their uh, traditional gender concepts, be it the feminism or politics, whatever be it, they wanted to move away, from, she urges to move away from these traditional things. So the next concept is genotics. So genotics is closely associated with Julia Kristeva and uh, she uses this term in order to explain the semiology or in order to explain this concept of semiotics. 
So according to her, the semiology, it is based on two concepts. One is a genotext and the other one is a phenotext. So at first, let's have a look on what this phenotext is. So phenotext denotes language that serves to communicate, which linguistics describe in terms of competence and performance. So phenotext is just like how, just like the terms of competence and performance that we use in, um, that we use in linguistics. So we know competence is a set of of rules that we use and performance is the way that we utter it. It is the physical manifestation of competence. So similarly, uh, phenotext actually shows the language that serves to communicate, language that is used in order to communicate. So that is what is called as a phenotext. It obeys rules of communication and presupposes a subject of enunciation. So it acts, so phenotext is based on the rules of communication. The main purpose of phenotext is that language is used in order to communicate. So according to Kristeva, this traditional notion of how language function, it obscure the fact that all language is founded on an underlying foundation that she terms as genotext. Okay, so uh, phonotext, as I said, phon uh, phonotext is like how this language or how language functions in a particular system so how it is used for communication but according to her genotext is the underlying foundation of a language or underlying foundation of this system so the genotext is, is closely associated with her concepts of Cora. So we know Cora is the general mother concept popularized by her and this evocative of our earlier stage of psychosexual development when we were most closely tied to our life and death drives. So we can say that genotest it refers to the physical rhythmic nature of language outside of signification. Okay, so it is not the communicative purpose here, but it is the underlying structure of a particular language. So designating the genotext in a text therefore requires pointing out the transfers of drive energy that can be detected in phonematic devices like the accumulation and repeti uh, repetition of phonemes or rhymes and melodic devices like intonation and rhythm. Okay, So one thing that you have to keep in your mind is that if you want to designate a genotext in a particular text, it, particular text you have to look at this drive energy. Okay, you have to point out the transfers of drive energy like in phonematic devices where we use phonemes or rhymes or where we use this melodic devices like intonation and rhythm. So that is not for communication but it is actually a beautification process. So that's the difference between a genotext and a phonotext. So a phonotext is like the language that is used in order to communicate but the genotext is the underlying structure of a language. So the next concept is hermeneutic circle. Hermeneutic circle, it was a term that was uh, coined by Frederick Schermacher. It was a term that was popularized by uh, Schermacher and you can find that this actually that is a hermeneutic cycle it describes the process of understanding a text hermeneutically that is it refers to the idea that one's understanding of the text as a whole is established by the reference to the individual parts and one's understanding of each individual part by reference to the whole so just have this in your mind hermeneutic circle means you if for example take a particular text your understanding of the text as a whole also refers to your understanding of the individual parts of a text okay similarly if you want to understand the individual parts of a text you have to understand the text as a whole so you cannot understand the parts without understanding the whole you cannot understand the whole without understanding the parts so that is what is called as a hermeneutic circle so everything happens within this circle Neither the whole text nor any individual part can be understood without reference to one another. Okay, you have, you cannot, as I said earlier, you cannot understand a literary text without understand, you cannot understand a literary text as a whole without understanding the parts and vice versa. You cannot understand the parts without understanding the whole. So we can say that it is a circle. Okay, it happens in a circle. But this circular character of interpretation does not make it impossible to interpret it. Text. Rather, it stresses.
stresses that the meaning of a text must be found within its cultural, historical and literary context. Okay, when I say that you cannot understand a text without understanding the parts and parts without understanding the whole, doesn't mean that you can never find the meaning of a text. But it actually means that in order to understand a literary text, you have to identify the meaning or the meaning of a text, it must be found within its cultural, historical and literary context. It has to be identified within this particular text. So, we can say that understand the meaning of a text is not about decoding the author's intentions. It is about establishing real relationship between the reader, text and the context. Okay, so, uh, if you want to understand the text, you shouldn't go for the go for decoding the author's intention, what the author thought in this particular line. No, that is not the way, but you have to establish another relationship that between the reader, the text and the context. Okay, the reader, the text and the context the author has got no option in it the author has got no meaning in it so even reading a sentence involves these repeated circular movements through a hierarchy of parts all relationships so even the meaning of a particular sentence happens within this circular thing so we can say that Thus, as we are reading this sentence, you are analyzing single words as the text unfolds. Okay, so here uh, you just don't have to take when I say parts or when I say the whole, it doesn't mean often the characters or sorry, often the chapters or the paragraphs. Even a single sentence is actually understood, it should be understood in such manner. When we read this sentence, we are analyzing the single words as the text unfolds. But you are also weighing the meaning of each word against our changing sense of the overall meaning of the sentence. So, the way, for example, if you watch a movie, the the perspective or the the favorite character of you my uh, at the first scene wouldn't be the favorite of you at the towards the end of the movie. So to, uh, so while all these incident happens, your perception also changes. Okay, so same is applicable in the case of literary text. So. That's what he says. Meaning of this sentence you are reading, or perhaps misunderstanding, or maybe this sentence is reminding you or clashing with another view about the interpretation you have in the past advocated or dispatched. Hence, we are brought to the sentence larger historical context depending on its location and our own circumstances. Okay, so just uh, remember, just try to figure out this with the example of a movie and also a literary text. You will get a hold of it. So let's look, this is what we called as the circle. So this is the context, this is the text. Okay, so context gives the initial understanding of the text and text it gives a new understanding of the context and this new context will give a new meaning for this particular text. I hope it is clear. That is the context the context gives an initial understanding of the text so while you read the text you get a new meaning or new understanding of the context and this new context will give you another understanding of the text okay so this actually happens at each and every process so this is what happens in uh, I mean, this is what happens while we are reading a particular text or this is what is called as the hermeneutic circle. So, let's look at the question once again. So, the terms are archaic creature which is closely associated with Yag Derrida. He coined the term in order to uh, explain a writing that, uh, that exists before the speech and writing. Then we have cyborg who uh, which is associated with Donna Haraway who uh, brings the cyborg in order to reject the distinctions between the human and animal and human and a machine. Then we have the genotex which is closely associated with Julia Kristeva which is considered to be the underlying structure of a language and then the hermeneutic circle which can be closely associated with show sure, matter which actually means uh, the you cannot understand a particular text without but you cannot under get the whole sense of a text without understanding the parts and without understanding the parts you cannot get a sense of the whole okay so these are the four terms and its associate theorist let's look at the options so here we know the answer is option a that is a4 b2 c1 and d3 so the answer is option 1 so that's all for this video. In this video, we dealt with four important terms that are very important uh, from literary theory that comes under literary theory from a net point of view. So here we discussed about hermeneutic circle, 
and the other uh, the other three literary terms that we discussed here so as i said in uh, at the beginning of this video this is the fourth video of this series so if you haven't gone through the other two videos or if you have missed any other videos just go through it so you will get an idea about all these terms and concepts which will actually help you to have to uh, have actually a look on how to deal with these things and how questions appear how the questions are asked from literary theory and also you will get an idea about these literary terms and concepts so that's all for this video thank you